Good morning, church. Wherever you are this morning, whether you're on holiday, whether you're sat in your living room, whether you're gathered with your friends and family, we just want to welcome you to church. Now, it's been so long since we've met in a church building all together, and I understand that sometimes it can feel frustrating not being able to to worship as we're used to and to be able to listen to a sermon the way we're used to. But I just want to encourage you that this is still only a season and that we are together in unity and in spirit right now in this very moment. Now, um, I just want to open up by um, just reading a psalm to you this morning because actually I know that a lot of us have been uh, reading Psalm 91 over our lives and over our families since the coronavirus hit. But actually, Psalm 92 is an amazing psalm. And it's actually a psalm written to be sung on the Sabbath day. And this is our Sabbath day. So I'm just going to read a few of the verses, starting at verse 1. In Psalm 92, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to the Most High. It is good to proclaim your unfailing love in the morning, your faithfulness in the evening, accompanied by a ten-stringed instrument, a harp and the melody of a lyre. You thrill me, Lord, with all you have done for me. I sing for joy because of what you have done. O Lord, what great works you do and how deep are your thoughts. Only a simpleton would not know. Only a fool would not understand this. Though the wicked sprout like weeds and evildoers flourish, they will be destroyed forever. But you, O Lord, will be exalted forever. And it says in verse 12, The godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. For they are transplanted to the Lord's own house they flourish in the courts of our God even in old age they will still produce fruit they will remain vital and green they will declare the Lord is just he is my rock there is no evil in him and I want to encourage you this morning whether you are feeling like you are a strong tree planted in the house of the Lord or whether you're feeling like sometimes how I feel like I'm a withering weed and don't know what to do with myself. We are God's children. We are loved. We are in the house of the Lord, planted by Jesus Christ. And whatever your circumstance, whatever your situation, you are loved. And it is my aim, as this said, in old age, to be able to declare the Lord is just. He is my rock and there is no evil in him. However you're feeling today, we're here for Jesus. And there's no better way to start than checking out those very lovely and awesome ladies from Sparks. Over to you, girls. What was that? Well, I'm trying. Am I not doing a very good job? Why am I hiding? Oh, it's a very good question. I'm hiding because we have lots of fights sometimes in our house and we say things we don't mean. And sometimes my feelings get hurt and sometimes Uncle Matt's feelings get hurt and sometimes Judah and Esther's feelings get hurt and we have to keep saying sorry. And sometimes, though, people, people can, can hurt you. And it's not so much that you have to say sorry. It's that you have to accept their apology. And you have to forgive them. And sometimes people do nasty things and we don't want to forgive them. So I was looking at what Jesus says all about this. And thinking about what the world teaches us. Now, so there's a saying. You might not have heard boys and girls, but it says this. It says, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And what that basically means is, boys and girls, is that we should only let people hurt us once. And then after that, we let them go. 
Well, that doesn't sound very nice, really, because we all make mistakes, don't we? I make mistakes all the time. So, did you know when Jesus was alive, the teachers of the day used to say that you had to forgive someone three times? One, two, three. And once you've forgiven them three times, you then don't have to forgive them anymore because you don't have to be their friends. But that's kind of sad because even though it's better than the one, I, I've made loads more mistakes than just three. Hmm. So, do you remember the guy we talked about last week? His name was Peter. And he said to Jesus, he was trying to be very holy. Because remember, he was taught that he had to forgive the people three times. So, get rid of that one. And he said, Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? Which means a family or friend or someone you know. And he said, is it seven times? Whoa, look at the size of that tower. Is it seven times, Jesus? Now this, as you can see, is a lot bigger than this one. So that's, a, that's good. That's a lot of forgiveness. That's forgiven someone lots of times. And Jesus said, no. Can you believe it? He said, nope. Not three times. Not seven times. But. Seventy. Dun, dun, dun times seven. Oh, I can't even get them all in the pictures, Sparks. I've lost my seven. We had to forgive people 70 times seven. Now, do you know how what that is? Now, I know you're all super good at maths and you figured it out already, but that is 490 times. Wow. But do you know what's really special about the number seven? The number seven means infinity or completeness of God. So, I don't think that Jesus means that we have to keep a record. And every time someone annoys us, we say, right, you are down to 286 choices. You make 286 bad choices and we're not going to be friends anymore. It doesn't mean that. It means that. The perfect number is seven, and it means it lasts forever. So Jesus is saying that we have to forgive people forever. Now that's hard because 70 times, that's a lot of things. That's a lot of hurt that people can do to us. And we have to forgive them 70 times seven, which means forever. Now why would you think Jesus says that? That's right, you've got it. It's because Jesus has forgiven us, not 70 times, not seven times, 70 times, but so many times that I've actually started to lose count. And that's the thing about the word called grace. Now, although grace is a very awesome person in our church, the word grace means when you give something to someone that they don't deserve. And we don't deserve God's forgiveness because we say sorry and we do the same thing. And we've done it hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of times. Well, especially us adults. But God still loves us and God still forgives us. So we need to give that grace that we've had from God and that forgiveness. And we need to give it out to absolutely everyone and show them that actually, although this the world may tell us that we have to forgive people only a few amount of times and then we have to get rid of them. God doesn't get rid of us. He loves us no matter how many times we mess up and we need to have that love for others. So I'm going to stop hiding and I'm going to go and say sorry and ask people's forgiveness in the house and then I'm going to find the sparks, girls. Whoop, whoop. See you later. <laughs> Loves each and every one of us. Um.
Thank you, Sparks. And that's a good lesson for us adults too. Is there a plank in your eye? We're going to go into worship now. And can I encourage you to stand? Can I encourage you to clap, to dance? Whatever it is you want to do this morning. But make sure that you worship God with everything you've got. Don't leave this service this morning not feeling refreshed by spending time in God's presence. We're going to start this morning by singing, He came to live, to live a perfect life for you and for me. Amen. He came to live, live a perfect life. He came to be the living word of life. He came to die. So we'd be reconciled He came to rise To show His power and might And that's why we praise Him That's why we sing That's why we offer Him our everything That's why we bow down and Worship this King Cause He gave His everything He came to be our conquering king and friend. He came to heal and show the last ones his love. He came to go. Everything, cause he gave. 
He came to live, live again in us. He came to be our conquering King and friend. He came to heal and show the last ones His love. He came to go.
blood Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free.
Lord, we thank you that you are our anchor. Lord, everything else in this world is fleeting. Everything else in this world is like sinking sand. But you are our rock. You are our true foundation. You are our anchor. And all the time, we keep ourselves on your foundation, on your rock, attached to your anchor. Whatever happens in our lives, we are secure. We have a reason to be joyful. We have a reason to be thankful. We have a friend who sticks closer than a brother, a father who loves more than anyone could ever love us. Thank you, Jesus.
Lord, we thank you. It is only by your blood that we may enter into the presence of the creator of this universe. Thank you, Lord, that it is not due to our own efforts. For none of us, none of us would be good enough. Thank you that you have taken all responsibility. That you have dealt with everything. It is finished, thanks to the blood of the Lamb. And we pray that as we now hear from Matt about how your forgiveness is greater than anything we can receive on this earth, may you help us to examine our hearts. Spirit, will you use the word of God to convict us, to challenge us, and to comfort us, to help us realize that we are nothing but dirty sinners in the hands of a gracious God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Over to Matt. Good morning, Parks. Uh, today in our Race Runner series, we're just going to be looking at the woman caught in adultery from John chapter 8. And depending on the translation that you're using, there might be scare quotes around this section saying something like, the most ancient manuscripts do not contain this passage. And that is true. The oldest uh, complete manuscripts that we have do not contain uh, this passage, but that doesn't mean that it's not inspired or that it's not God's word to us. Uh, St. Augustine tells us that this passage in his day had been excluded from certain manuscripts in order to avoid the impression that Christ had sanctioned adultery. Uh, he writes, certain persons of little faith, or rather enemies of the true faith, fearing, I suppose, left their wives should be given to impunity and sinning, removed from their manuscripts the Lord's act of forgiveness towards the adulteress, as if he who had said sin no more had granted permission to sin. And there's a, a, another very early Christian named uh, uh, Papias, who was a friend of the uh, uh, Apostle John, and he mentions that story again in his writings. And so John, um, he's aware of it as a friend of John. So um, John 8, 1 through to 11. Uh, follow with me. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, uh, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. And as he was speaking, the teachers of religious law, the Pharisees, brought a woman who'd been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her, but what do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying uh, something that they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his fingers. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who's never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down again and he wrote in the dust. Then his accusers heard this. They slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, then neither do I. Go and sin no more. Now, we do not know who this woman are, is. Um, she's unnamed in the gospel passage for today. Uh, but some reason in our memories, we often associate a sinful woman repenting with Mary Magdalene. But even with the case of Mary, she only has a sinful past if we combine her story, which is in Luke 8-2, with the Mary of Bethany in Luke 10, and the unnamed sinful woman who anoints Jesus' feet in Luke 7. Pope Gregory was perhaps the first Christian to, divine, to combine these three accounts in his Easter sermons in 591 AD. Uh, Eastern Christians today don't combine those stories, and so Mary Magdalene is not in their eyes a, a sinful woman who repents. Uh, it's just about how you combine the characters in the scriptures. So, we do not know who the lady in this account is. What we do know is that she's brought to Jesus. The teachers of the religious law, the Pharisees, on the basis of the law of Moses, specifically Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 22 to 25, and Leviticus 20, 10, want to stone her. But before they stone her, they want to know what Jesus would say about it. They want him to speak against Moses. They're trying to trick him. 
Paul in Galatians 3, 24, 26, and I'm just going to do it from the New King James, uh, writes, Therefore the law is our tutor to bring us to Christ, so that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor, for you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now Paul tells us the purpose of the law is to tutor us, to be our guardian, to be our, our schoolmaster, to show us our need for Christ. This was in order that we might be justified by faith. So Paul says in verse 25, but after faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. So the purpose of the law is to show us our need for Christ, our need for a saviour. And Paul says this explicitly in Romans 3, 19 through to 20. Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it's given, for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. So the law according to Paul, number one, keeps us from having excuses. Number two, shows that the entire world is guilty before God. Number three, shows us that we can't, by the law, become okay with God, because we always fail, we always mess up. And four, in summary, it shows us just how sinful we are. So in summary then, the law helps us to control our sinful nature, but it shows us what is wrong. It keeps order in a chaotic world, but in reality it's a mirror to our souls to show us our sin, to show how we fail to meet the standards that God's word supplies. It shows us ultimately our need for a saviour. Now Christians often talk about God speaking through two words, the law and the gospel. The law commands, it demands, it accuses, it curbs, it convicts, it exposes, it condemns and it guides. Whilst the gospel gives, forgives, justifies, redeems, saves, motivates, strengthens, encourages, comforts and assures us. We need both of those words. We can't live without either of them. And John likes to show us this distinction, for example, in John 1 uh, 17 he says the law was given through Moses but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ it's not the law that gives us God's uh, love and faithfulness no it's Jesus Christ the law cannot do that you can't earn God's favor through the law rather it accuses you of your wrongdoing so how does Jesus respond we read in John 8 6 and 7 they were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him but Jesus stooped down he wrote in the dust with his finger they kept demanding an answer and so he stood up again and said all right but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone uh, we don't know what Jesus is writing in the sand it's never told to us but Jesus here points us to the use of the law it condemns yes the woman is guilty yes the woman has sinned. Yes, the woman deserves death, but James in James 2.10 reveals the heart of the matter for the person who keeps all of the laws except one is guilty as a person who's broken all of God's laws. They are a lawbreaker. And Jesus asks again, all right, but let the one who sinned, never sinned, throw the first stone. He shows us the purpose of the law, to show us our need for a saviour. We're all lawbreakers. We're all in need of a saviour. The woman's problem was that she was caught. It's a very public sin. The teachers of religious law, the Pharisees, they had sins. They just hid theirs. Jesus is exposing their hearts. And we see the older the person was, they went away. They know they sinned. They know that they've messed up. We're living through a transition in our own society at this moment. And it goes to the heart of what the gospel passage for today speaks about. On the 1st of November 2019, so last year in November, the former US President Barack Obama said this, we can't completely remake society in a minute. So we have to make some accommodations to the existing structures. This idea of purity, that you're never compromised, that you're always politically woke, 
all that stuff. You should get over that quickly. The world is messy. There are ambiguities. People do really good stuff, have flaws. People you are fighting may love their kids. They may share certain things with you. If you tweet or hashtag about how you didn't do something right or use the wrong verb, I can sit back and feel good about myself. Man, see how woke I was. I called you out. That's not activism. That's not bringing about change. If all you're doing is casting stones, you're probably not going to get that far. That's easy to do. Now, Obama is here criticising a worrying trend in Western societies. People who are just casting stones. They're dramatic with black and white thinking. There's no ambiguities. It's an idea about purity and always pointing the finger at those who do not see the world as they do. Obama calls this thinking woke. Many philosophers have written and spoken in recent months about the transformation that our society is going through. Some label it the Great Awakening, as similar to the Great Awakenings when Christianity revived uh, in America. Now, this woke acts in some ways kind of like a religion uh, with its own language and culture. Heretical is problematic. Blasphemy is not politically correct. The original sin is privilege. Church is the safe spaces on campuses or in workplaces or whatever. Born again is to become woke, to have woken up to the way the world is. To be inclusive now means to be exclusive of certain views. What everyone knew to be true yesterday is denied today. Unfortunately, racism has been redefined now as just a one-way street. You can't be racist against white people because they're the ones with the power. Woke religion speaks a lot about sin, but not about grace. It's all law, no gospel. We saw this in the recent riots that went on. The protesters declared war on our statues, sought to deface and bring down the effigies of Mahatma Gandhi, of Winston Churchill, Christopher Columbus, George Washington, even Abraham Lincoln, applying their own modern standards of morality upon historical figures trying to sort them into simplistic boxes of he was good, he was bad, um, and if found inadequate, to cancel them from history altogether. As Jesus says, let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Obama's right, the world is messy. There are ambiguities. People who do really good things have flaws. Gandhi employed non-violent resistance that led to a successful campaign for India's independence from British rule. It in turn inspired civil rights movements and became freedoms across the world. And yet he had problematic views about race, especially in his early life and career. So Gandhi is cancelled. His statues defaced and torn down because of his sin. Friends, the world is messy. There are ambiguities. People who do really good stuff have flaws. As Jesus says, let the one who's never sinned cast the first stone. We're living in an era where people are shamed or deplatformed or cancelled online for failing to conform to a modern witch trial, to modern purity tests. No allowance is given for context, for human agencies, to flaws, to complexity in your character. Something you said 10 years ago is dragged up and used to destroy you in the present. Friends, we need to be careful of people who want to tear down walls without knowing where those walls were built. As with all justice movements, we need to be careful. Do we just love the poor? Do we love and affirm things? Or do we just hate the rich? Loving the poor means we're going to enact laws to help them. Hating the rich means we're going to do all we can to be rid of the people with the power. People want to tear down our society, but what do they want to replace it with? Are they coming from a place of love or a place of hate? And what do their actions show about their motives and their thoughts and thinking behind it? George Orwell, in his dystopian novel 1984, wrote about a totalitarian state, how every book has been rewritten, every picture has been repainted, every statue and street building has been renamed, every date has been altered, and that process is continuing day by day, minute by minute, adds Orwell's character. History has stopped. 
one of the taglines in the book is he who controls the past, uh, the future, the past, sorry. He who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. We are living in dangerous territory when those in power or those wanting to take power rewrite our history in order to control our future. That's dangerous territory. We need to be honest about the past. We might have to confess that we've sinned and we made errors in the past, but at least let the past be the past and we can learn from those mistakes, not rewrite it. We read in John 8, 8 to 11, when he stood down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. So here, at the end of this passage, we see a woman liberated from the law by the gospel. Jesus says, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she says. And Jesus says, so neither do I. Go and sin no more. So Jesus here offers her forgiveness and then encourages her to go and sin no more. He does not say, keep on sinning. No, he forgives her. And now that she's free, he tells her to sin no more. She doesn't have to not sin in order to earn forgiveness. Rather, he forgives us and then says, go and sin no more. Friends, racism is wrong. Hatred is wrong. Oppression is wrong. But casting stones, condemning others is also wrong. Matthew, Jesus in Matthew 7, 2 says, For the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Jesus in today's gospel did not say that woman hadn't sinned. He said he simply refrained from supporting the mob justice. And when he offered her grace, he never downplayed her sin. Instead, he simply told her, go and sin no more. Today's social justice warriors throw stones at others to show how good they are and direct people's attention away from their own personal sins in order to attack others, to make those be the scapegoats, those to be the sacrifice. It's easy to shame people on Facebook or Twitter for not using the right pronouns or saying the wrong thing. Those things don't, however, deal with the issues of the heart. Instead, sacrificing someone else in order to look good. Christ sacrificed himself for the sake of the sins of us all. Friends, because of our exile from God, we were naked, we were shamed, we were separated from God. Yet Jesus, who pre-existed with the Father, took on our shameful flesh, became incarnate, fulfilling the promises of Scripture. He died for your sins, as the Scriptures said that he would, removing your sin and your shame. He was hung naked on a cross, publicly humiliated for you. He was bruised for you. He was buried for you. He was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, so that you might be raised to honour with him. He appeared to many, showing that he was raised from the dead. He is seated as God's right hand, as King and Messiah, and he will come again to judge to set the world to rights. You now have honour because he has all the honour. Where you were once rejected, now you are accepted. No longer in shame and dishonour, you've been clothed with his honour. Friends, in conclusion, may we be those who follow Christ in his pattern of living in the world. Let us not pick up stones with the mob, ready to throw them at the guilty. Rather, let us act like Christ, saying, let the one who's never sinned throw the first stone. Where are your accusers? Don't even one of them condemn you, so neither do I. Go and sin no more. Friends, we have sinned. The law shows us our sins. So let us drop our stones, our accusations, and forgive others their wrongdoing. We're forgiven because of Christ. So let us forgive others. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, that we might be your hands, your feet of forgiving others in the world. We pray that we might follow the example of Christ and not throw stones, but rather forgive for the sake of love. Help us to be those who love in the world and show a better way. 
than the ways of power and politics in our own lives. Amen. Thank you, Matt, for that very convicting but also very encouraging sermon. Um, as we're going to go into communion now, I really felt it would be appropriate to allow all of us to have a time just to examine our hearts, and to um, try and see into our lives, ask God to search us for those sins that we so often commit without realizing, but also to uh, have the acceptance of that forgiveness that we have just heard about. I'm going to read from Romans 8 today, starting at verse 29. It says, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many, many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is now sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. As we take the, the bread and the wine, I want to remind you that Jesus' job on the cross was not the end. He died on the cross. Yes, our sins are forgiven. Yes, we have been made righteous by his grace alone. But he is pleading for you right now at the right hand of the Father. So can I encourage you to examine your hearts, to ask God to show you his forgiveness, to ask God to penetrate the deepest parts of you, that nothing is left unspoken before him during this communion time.
am heavy burdened who will deliver me though I sink in guilt and shame grace flows deeper though I run against your will grace runs faster though I hide away from you grace comes nearer spirit help me know it is finished it is finished no more running no more hiding my siri will can rest it is finished it is finished no more striving no more taking all in christ i now possess it is finished i'm failing unable who will deliver It's finished No condemnation No guilty shame No past to hurt me None in Christ None in Christ Gone is my record Gone my regrets Gone is my failure Gone in Christ Gone in Christ Found is my meaning, found is my name, found is my purpose, found in Christ, found in Christ, and all of his dying, and all of his life, all of his merit, all in Christ, all in Christ. and shame grace flows deeper though i run against your will grace runs faster though i hide away from you grace comes nearer spirit help me know it is finished it is Possess it is finished. It's finished. Lord, we thank you that it is finished. That you have done everything. That there's nothing we can do to add to your salvation. And there's also nothing we can do to take it away. 
thank you for your forgiveness. Amen. Amen. Excuse my throat. Um, thank you for joining with us this morning. Um, the notices for this week are we have a very special birthday. We have the Adam Headland. Um, is turning <coughs> this week. So um, have a great birthday, Adam. We love you and we wish we could celebrate with you. Um, but I'm sure your parents will give you a great birthday. Um, there are no house groups this week, just to remind you. Um, but we are encouraging people to meet within the legal guidance um, with other people from within the church. Please don't see it as church being closed as the building as a reason to not have fellowship still. So please do meet up and remember to send us your awesome photos of where you are worshipping with us on a Sunday. Um, we've already had some from the beach and it's awesome to see. So please do let us know where you are and where you are watching. So we are just going to end now with the song, Boldly I Approach Your Throne. And the great um, first line of this song is, by grace alone, somehow I stand, where even angels fear to tread, invited by redeeming love before the throne of God above. Angels fear to tread Invited by redeeming love Before the throne of God above He pulls me close With nailed scarred hands Into His my heart and Satan tempts me to despair I hear the voice that scatters fear the great I am the Lord is here oh praise the one who died for me and shields my and risen sun more beauty than this world has known I'm face to face with love himself his perfect spotless righteousness a thousand years a thousand times I'm not
that we can boldly come this morning where angels fear to tread because of the grace and the forgiveness of you through the Lord Jesus by your spirit. And we pray this week that we will not live in condemnation, that we will not live in fear and in shame and in guilt, but we will live in the resurrection of Christ. However we feel, however what is happening around us, may we live in the truth that your grace is enough for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, guys.